Welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast. This is Tribune Sports Editor Joe Wall Jasper along with Tribune Football Beat Writer Dave Matter. Dave, we are coming to you from the post-spring point of view now. Uh, just your thoughts on the, the spring game and most particularly with the quarterback situation. Well, I, I don't think we walked away from, uh, from Faroe Field last Saturday uh, convinced that anyone had really won the quarterback job mm -hmm. and, and I think the coaches felt the same way. It, James Franklin w was number one going into the day. Uh, I, coaches haven't said anything. They haven't approved of any kind of depth chart or, or said anything official, but I think we'd probably assume he's probably slightly ahead in the race when mm -hmm. things start up again in August as number one. Uh, but I don't think he has a great lead on, on Tyler Gabbert uh, by any means, uh, even though Gabbert had a pretty rough day on Saturday. I, I think James probably had a little less rough day. Uh, he, he put up better numbers by far, but uh, neither one really stood out as a guy that you can say, wow, this offense is going to be in, in great shape this year. They, they both looked like uh, really young players, which, which they are. If you only watched that spring game, you would probably think that why are we even having this discussion about Tyler Gabbert? But I think, as you pointed out, over the course of the spring, their numbers were almost identical. Yeah. So, I mean, and the coaches have said they don't really weigh the spring game any more than any other practice. So, I think you can't really read too much into that. But maybe the bigger issue now is, is either one of these guys someone who can Missouri can win with? I'm not entirely convinced of that yet. Uh, David Yost is, the offensive coordinator. He said on Saturday that whoever wins the job, um, and he doesn't know yet who it's going to be, uh, they feel like we'll have a, a good season and we'll, their quarterback position, is how he described it, uh, will be in good shape. And he's really basing that off of the guys, the surrounding cast around mm -hmm. those whoever the quarterback is, the, the experienced offensive line that Missouri has with four seniors up on the front five. Uh, they've got a lot of depth at wide receiver. They've got everyone back who, who ran the ball last year at tailback. So um, they're really banking on all that surrounding experience to be um, to help along whoever wins the quarterback job. Um, and, and he has confidence in, in either of them, I guess, to, to have this offense at least, I think, be competent is, mm -hmm. is maybe the best way to, to look at it. But um, I'm, I'm not as convinced, frankly. Um, and if you look at Missouri's schedule, it's, it's not – very easy. I mean, mm -hmm. it starts off pretty rough with a trip to Arizona State in week two. Uh, so that, that's going to be a tough game for whoever wins the quarterback job. And um, I don't know. I, you look at Blaine Gabbert a year ago, and, and he, he didn't have a great year statistically. Didn't have a lot of huge big plays, but he also didn't make a lot of big mistakes. Mm -hmm. He did in that last game, but, but other than that, he didn't. And that's, I think, kind of the fear with young quarterbacks that haven't looked great so far. Are they not only not going to make a lot of big plays, are, are they going to make a lot of mistakes and throw a lot of interceptions and, and cause some turnovers and make bad decisions? So that's, I think that's kind of the fear. Yeah, with some offenses, certainly you can have a game manager back there to hand the ball off or, you know, play extra pass, whatever. It's really not a spread offense, though. It really is so dependent on the quarterback making all the right reads and throwing the ball quite a bit. So it's, it's going to be interesting because they really haven't had this situation probably, well, certainly not since they've gone to spread offense. They've always had the star quarterback. Um, and I don't think even the most optimistic people are gonna would think that either James Franklin or Tyler Gabbert in their first year would be a star quarterback. Yeah. So that's going to be a little bit of a different thing. Now they do have, like you mentioned, a lot of guys back, good offensive line, you know, lots of weapons. But uh, it's going to be tricky. I, I think it's it's kind of the unknown because you've been here so long with Pinkle that you kind of have come to expect, you know, at the worst maybe eight wins and at the best maybe ten or eleven. It's going to be interesting to see if if, yeah. if a, if a without a star quarterback if they can kind of match that production. And, and to some degree, I think, I think Pinkle and Yost also kind of deserve a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because right. they are so good with quarterbacks. There's a lot of time left. Uh, these summer months are pretty crucial as far as a seven-on-seven seven and, and getting the chemistry down with the receivers. And uh, I, I think it's safe to say the August practices are a lot more intense than what goes on during the spring. So uh, these guys are going to be under a lot of pressure and a lot of scrutiny. And, and maybe one of them then will start separating himself a little bit more uh, from the other and, and look uh, like a Big 12 spread quarterback that can really lead this offense. But I don't think we can really say that after watching uh, the last six weeks or so. Now, do you think there's any chance at all that Corbin Burkstresser, their true freshman quarterback, can be coming in can get in the, in the mix Normally, I would say not a chance because that's such a hard position to, to come in and, and win a job uh, when, when you're not arriving on campus till June or, mm -hmm. or late May. Uh, but this situation, with no established player at the position, with so much established, so many established players at all the other offensive positions, 
maybe something can work out. Maybe if he comes in and just lights the world on fire his first couple weeks of practice, uh, that's possible. But again, it's just so rare to see mm -hmm. that happen with a freshman. Usually their, their, their mind and their, their heads are spinning all over the place right. because it, it's, it's such a transition from high school. But uh, I think it would be wise to at least keep an, keep an open mind about him when, when he comes out to practice here in August. Now defensively, it's kind of a normal thing in spring. The defense usually does look better than the offense. But uh, throughout the spring and, and in the spring game, they really did look pretty dominant. Um, also, they were playing without some of their better players, too. The right. linebacker position especially was really thin. Um, just your thoughts on whether this could be a better defense than they had last year, which was a pretty good defense. They were pretty good in that they were number six in the country in mm -hmm. scoring defense. I think this group has a chance to be better um, statistically in a lot of areas, but I, I just think they'll pass the eyeball test a little bit better. I don't mm -hmm. think they'll get gashed up the middle like they did a few times after Dominique Hamilton, uh, their, their best nose tackle, went down for the year against Oklahoma. I, I think they'll be better up front, uh, just more depth. I mean, you lose Alden Smith, huge loss, obviously, but they, they've got a lot of guys they can plug in at defensive end, not to mention what might be the best starting tandem in the Big 12 in, in Brad Madison and, mm -hmm. and Jacque Smith. Um, so I, I think they're going to be fine up front, maybe as, as good as they have been in a, in a long time, and everything starts up there. And I think in the secondary they've got some new faces back there, but they might be more athletic than they were a year ago. Um, you know, Carl Geddes, Jarrell Harrison, Kevin Rutland all became good players at Missouri, but I think the athletes they have now with Tavon Bolden, EJ Gaines, uh, Kip Edwards as a junior now, I, I just think they might be a little faster back there. Maybe they can hang with some of the receivers and, and some of the spread offenses that they'll see in the Big 12 and, and just be better all around. And, and in the middle at linebacker, it's always a question of staying healthy there, and that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of been a problem. But they do have good players when healthy at those positions. So I think overall they can be better. Yeah. Now, last year they may have overachieved, overachieved a little bit to be the number six, so there's always a possibility they will maybe will come back a little bit at the back. Sure. But they also had a crazy amount of injuries last year, which I think in most normal years you're not going to lose that many guys. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that defense. And I think the other thing is, uh, beyond Brad Madison and Jockey Smith, they got some other pretty good players, like on the edge. I thought Coney Ely looked great in the spring scrimmage. I think he's a guy that could really come in and make a big impact. Then at linebacker, I thought Darvin Ruiz, uh, not only against the run, but also in coverage, was pretty good. He yeah. like, looks like a guy that could really contribute uh, this year, too. Yeah, and if, and if they can rotate more players in and out, that just makes the starters a lot more fresh, and they can go longer and make more big impact plays, too. So I, I, I think they're in a really good situation on that side of the ball. Then the last addition, hopefully, from Missouri's point of view to the defense will be Sheldon Richardson. And just kind of as our final, final sp uh, thought of spring before we go into the summer, just What's kind of the latest on him, and what kind of impact, if he does make it here, what do you think he's going to make? Well, Gary Pinkle and his coaches still insist that they expect him to be here in June uh, as part of the program, enrolled and, and going through all the summer conditioning stuff. Uh, I know he's in St. Louis now, wrapping up some classes. Uh, he, he's working out. I've been told he's in, he's in really good shape, uh, just around 300 pounds, but, but a good, healthy 300 pounds. So. You know, if he's nearly as good as advertised, and the, of all the people that have watched him play and have, and have analyzed his play, uh, it's got to be a good addition to the defensive line. And, and it's a defensive line that doesn't necessarily need him, I don't mm -hmm. think. I think they can still be really good, one of the better lines in the Big 12, if not one of the two or three best without him. With him, if he's that good, um, I think it's pretty exciting for that group because um, you can't have enough talent, really elite athletes at those interior positions, 300-pound guys that can run all over the place and get after the quarterback. You, we really haven't seen that at Missouri. Mm -hmm. You see it at Nebraska with, with Sue. You see it at Oklahoma every couple of years, but not so much at Missouri. So I, I think that if they can get him and finally um, cash in on so many years of recruiting him and all mm -hmm. the drama that's, that's gone on, uh, it, it could really be big for this defense. And, you know, I, I also think that Craig Kuligowski is probably not considered one of the best defensive line coaches in America because he's, he's just not as familiar with him. I think he does a really good job of developing talent. Mm -hmm. They've had 10 guys in the last 10 years, first or second team, all Big 12. A lot of those guys were very much under the radar, but he really, I think, gets the most out of a lot of those players. Uh, Dave Steckel, his boss, defensive coordinator, told me last week that that he's really good at pushing the buttons of guys. Mm -hmm. and, and Sheldon's going to come into a situation where this is going to be the most talent he's ever been surrounded by and and if he's a good competitor I think that'll push him and, and make him uh, want to be one of the best guys right off the bat so we'll see if he's if he's as good as they say he is he should be a starter on this defense eventually mm -hmm. you see Missouri sometimes with 
great athletes on the, the end position. It, not that often you see one with a really disruptive, high-end athletic ability inside, which if he's all that he's cracked up to be, that would give them something that they really don't have a lot. You see a, a lot of times the SEC defenses, or, or like you mentioned, that Sue at Nebraska or the guys at Oklahoma or Texas, but Missouri, those are the, I think those are the, almost the most rare players. I mean, they say cornerback may be the hardest, but I think the most rare guys are super athletic interior defensive line. Absolutely, and, and the best defenses tend to have one of those guys, and uh, it, it would be interesting to see if, if that's how he pans out. Okay, well, that's going to wrap it up for us for the uh, football offseason. Uh, join us again in August when we will start talking about the preseason practices.